What's up hobby friends, my name is Casey and welcome to another miniature rescue. This week we're going to take a look at a large scale space marine from the game Inquisitor. This video is sponsored by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and share what makes you unique in your hobby. Games Workshop makes an absolute ton of models and games. Blood Bowl, Necromunda, Kill Team, Warcry, and Warhammer, of course. And they all feature highly detailed 28mm miniatures. But in 2001, Specialist Games, a division of Games Workshop that put out smaller run tactical games, released Inquisitor. Usually that wouldn't bring much more attention than the average release, but this game was a little different. It was played using insane 54mm models gigantic metal monstrosities that were blown up versions of characters from the 40k universe. And when I say that these models were big, I mean big. Just look at this head compared to a normal space marine. The neck of this model is bigger than the full head of the other marine. Inquisitor went on to have a few years of moderate success and eventually got lost to the winds of change that are Games Workshop. On top of that, <laughs> Specialist Games got shut down. Of course today, most of those games have been brought back in full and are currently being supported, including Inquisitor, but not in the same way as it was 20 years ago. In fact, after the game died, a new version of the game popped up called Inc. 28, short for Inquisitor 28, a community reimagining of the original game using rules from the original and other games like Necromunda, and whatever extras were printed in Citadel publications that could or would possibly fit into a grimdark semi-role-playing game. What I find fascinating is that there are still people playing this game, albeit with a ton of twists to suit playstyle and lore, but being played nonetheless. Of course, I'm only just starting to unwrap this story and I don't know a ton about it, but if you do, I highly encourage you to link some of your favorite resources down in the comments. Share the things that brought you to this side of the hobby as I'm sure there are more people who would love to know more, including myself. But now that the game has clearly evolved past its 54mm scale and taken on an entirely new set of rules, official and not, what are we supposed to do with these models? Honestly, they're relics of the past, long dead and mostly forgotten, and realistically useless in any game that Games Workshop currently makes. Well, we can paint them, of course. Because at the end of the day, a mini is a mini. And the more we paint, the better we get at it. I was sent this Inquisitor Tyrus model a while back by Alexi from the Happy Halfling Painting Studio. He told me that the model was in really bad shape and it needed some help. Let's take a look and see what he was talking about. At first glance, I can already see some severe damage to the metal. Whatever kind of bath this old guy had previously really did a number on the model and has actually corroded away some of the material. Take a look at the torso in particular. Look how much material has been taken away on the back and on the Inquisitor symbol above the head. There's actually quite a lot of detail missing that I'm not sure we can even get back. I'm also finding quite a bit of super glue buildup on the joints, which is fairly common on larger metal models like this. We will need to soften the glue up with some deactivator and get those pieces down to bare metal, and possibly pin everything together so it holds. He's also missing a finger. Luckily though, the rest of the model seems to be here, so let's do some cleaning up and see what he looks like. The first thing we need to do is get these parts into the sonic cleaner and try and get whatever paint is left on the model taken off, and clean up whatever else may be on it. Next, I get my Dremel and soft wire brush to really shine up that pewter. At an angle and with a light touch, I can take away any of the excess paint left on the model. The soft wire bristles ensure that the model isn't being damaged any more than it already has been, and it gives each piece a nice shine to it. I also use some super glue deactivator onto the deposits of leftover glue to start to loosen those up. Once the solution gets settled into the glue, it starts to melt and become liquid again. Then it's as easy as either wiping it away or using an X-Acto blade to pop pop out the large spots of glue left over. Once the pieces have been cleaned up, I can get a better look at the pitting and try and fill some of those larger holes and gaps. I decided to use some Tamiya putty to do the job. This stuff is thicker and dries rather quickly, so we can fill holes and gaps and come back in with a sanding stick to get those areas smooth again. I lay some of the putty out on a scrap piece of cardboard and use a metal spatula to spread it on the model. The back and neck of the torso armor were the worst parts of the model, so hopefully we can fill those in and bring some of that detail back. 
In the least, the larger gaps will be filled and we can get creative during the painting process to figure out the rest. A little battle damage never hurt a space marine before and real damage can be a good way to sell the fact that these guys have seen some battle. The last issue to fix before assembly is that missing finger. Now I happen to have a pointy power glove from an old model laying around, so I was able to snip off what would be the lower half of the thumb. And I'll use green stuff to create the upper half that connects to the slot where the finger is supposed to go. The scale is off, but since I'm using a 28mm finger as the tip of the new one, it actually works out rather nicely in this case. And I didn't have to sculpt the thumb entirely from scratch. Before we continue, let's talk about the amazing sponsor of this video, Squarespace. Sharing what makes you unique in this hobby can be difficult. When you post a picture on a social media platform and someone asks you, hey, how'd you do that? Well, you can take your time to type out a long explanation of the X, Y, and Z steps of how you got there, but that post will eventually be probably pretty hard to find and not really ever be referenced again. Using Squarespace's easy to use custom templates, you can create that mini tutorial in minutes, and on top of that, share it directly to any social media page. This week, I updated my Squarespace hobby blog by adding a quick tutorial on how to base your models using basic hobby products and things you can just find laying around. It was really simple to set up and share exactly what I wanted in just a few minutes. A little bit of dragging, dropping, and typing, and it was done. And I think that's pretty cool. Everyone in this hobby has a unique perspective, and with Squarespace, you can absolutely share that with others in a very easy and fun way. Check out squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch that hobby blog, go to squarespace.com slash miniature rescues to save 10% off of your first purchase of a website or domain. Thank you again Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Now let's get back to that crazy 54 millimeter model. All right, so the parts of the model have been cleaned. The base is pretty much ready to go and it's time to put this guy together. I drilled paper clip size holes into a few areas on the model that I knew wouldn't hold on their own. And I had to clear out some space for the larger pewter pins that the model already had in order to slot them into the arm sockets. Once these pieces were connecting properly, super glue was more than enough to hold them in place. I did leave the head separate because it would be pretty difficult to paint around that while it was attached. The cavity where the head goes is pretty deep and I really want to do some fun stuff while it's not too difficult to get. Inquisitor Tyrus happens to be on the cover of the actual rulebook for this game and he looks really good. So I printed off a picture of him to use as a reference for painting. Now the art in this book is nothing short of iconic and really paints a picture of the grim dark universe. There are a ton of amazing illustrations within the pages and I can really see the influence that it brought to subsequent versions of this game. If you can find one of these books in the wild, it's more than worth picking up, if for nothing else, the art inside. The cover photo shows Tyrus with really dark bluish armor and gold accents. And let's not forget that really cool glow coming from underneath the face. So I'm gonna paint him in a similar style using blues and golds. Hopefully we can do this model some justice, even if the sculpt is most definitely lacking in the same sort of imagination that the art brings. Not to say that the model isn't pretty awesome, but it doesn't really have the same grimdark aesthetic that the book describes, or kind of derpy. That's fine. I start with a dark blue through the airbrush. I even added a little bit of turbo dork metallic blue to the mix to give the armor a little bit of shine to it. The effect is pretty cool, but it still needs that punch of blue. Sparingly, I added the blue to the armor and let the gradient on each panel really show. It's pretty bright right now, but I plan on taking that down a little bit with some washes. For now, getting the color on the model is a good step. Next up, blocking in the trim with that gold, you can see how that dark blue and lighter blue work together. We have some nice strong gradients on the armor and that gold really frames those pieces. After that, I pick up some metallic steel and fill in the mechanical parts of the model. There are plenty of small details that will look good in silver, and they should take a black wash really well to bring out more detail. There is a rather large leather gun holster on Tyrus's leg, so I base it with a dark brown and a highlight using an orange brown and a tan to give it that worn look. That should help it match with the pretty beaten up armor on the model.
With all of the base layers down, it's time to darken the model a bit and bring in some black lining with Tamiya Panel Liner. In this case, I pretty much use it as an all over wash. It really helps bring those colors together and over the gold especially, it brings out that detail and gives a tarnished look. While that wash is drying, I'm gonna focus on painting the head. The real nice thing about heads in this scale is that they're much easier to paint than normal. I started with a dark purple brown as a base coat and began to highlight up by adding a light brown into the mix. Focusing on the raised details of the brow, nose, and cheeks, we can get a nice result pretty quickly. Another bonus of larger scales is that you can get away with painting in less details because the light interacts with the model on a more realistic scale, so shadows that are being cast by the light from above give a more natural look. It's still a small enough scale that you can't really rely on that, but it's something to keep in mind. I follow that up with a glaze of deep purple red in the shadows to blend those colors together and bring in more depth. For the eye, I dotted in a circle of white and followed that up with some blue for the iris. And finally, I'll finish off the skin with a bright highlight of light brown stippled onto those aforementioned details. If you didn't catch that sweet face tutorial that I did last week, check it out right here. Fill in the metallic bits with the same steel color and the head is pretty much done. Now that the oil wash is dry on the main body, I want to edge highlight the armor panels to create more separation between each piece. The shoulder pads have those long strips of gold that on their own look fine, but I want to bring in a little more personality to the model. In doing research for this model, I found that there were a lot of instances where these parts were filled in by some kind of script, generally the name of the model. Starting with a thin down dark blue, I sketched out the name Tyrus. Once I knew where each letter was going to go, I came in a little darker until the letters were easy to read. To clean anything up, which when doing freehand writing will almost always happen, I can just come back in with the base gold color and refine my shapes. It worked pretty well and now he's got his name on his armor ready for the lost and found box at school. The last thing I want to show on this model is a tube coming from his back attached to the spiky glove. There are several tubes running to that hand and one of them is big enough that we can kind of have some fun. Let's start with a yellow with some good coverage, something in the ochre family. After that layer is dry, I'll follow that up with a brighter yellow. Then using black, I want to make thick lines at an angle as evenly spaced as I can by eye, trying to keep them at a similar angle and thickness all the way down. On its own, this is the easy way to make tubes like this but there are a couple of other steps we can take to really make it look extra nice. With some orangey brown, specifically scrag brown from Citadel, I'll paint in the lower half of each yellow stripe. This color gives a very nice shadow color to yellow and brings another level of complexity to the shape. Follow that up by glazing in some bright yellow from the middle of the color to the top and you have a nice transition in color for those stripes. Finally, I wanna bring in some reflections to really sell the effect, so I use some off-white on the side. You can almost edge highlight this color using the side of your brush, just hitting in a few places to sell that specular highlight on the shiny tube. It works really well on larger tubes like this. One more thing to do in order to finish off this model, and that's giving him that glow underneath his head. So I'll set that up using some white ink through the airbrush, just trying to angle my spray so it will only hit in one direction, then follow that up with some transparent red ink. This model is very interesting in that there's pretty much no use for it in today's Warhammer world. He's weird looking, overly large, and really can't stand in for anything in particular. What it does lack for in all of those areas, it makes up for in experience of painting something different. Something that makes you think a little differently as a painter and try new things. Having the luxury of size, you can more easily practice skills on armor panels, faces, and tubes. Getting to see those concepts played out at a slightly larger scale, you can see where you might need to improve in order to get the results you want on a normal model. 
It's also great to take a trip through the history of a game like Inquisitor, because it's not something you see every day. The book all by itself is the biggest win here, and has a ton of awesome art and descriptions that can inspire you to try something new. Honestly, it spawned an entire underground scene for painting and gameplay that has continued to bring new people into the Warhammer universe, and that's something to be celebrated. If you can find a copy of the original book or one of these crazy 54mm models, think about adding them to your collection just to try something something new. What it comes down to for me is that a model like this gets me out of my comfort zone and I can try new things and not really have to worry about how it's going to turn out. Especially being a metal model that I can strip if I want to, I can continue to perfect certain things on a larger scale so that I can actually see where I'm making those mistakes. Plus having kind of cool giant metal models just in your collection, it's just cool. Thank you for joining me on another Miniature Rescue. If you like something about this video, please feel free to like, share, and subscribe as it really helps out the channel. Once again, I'm Casey, and I will see you in the next video.